There are some interesting implications within the genre of historical strategy games if you dig around a bit. Video games as a whole are like any media and can be read not just for their text, but their subtext as well. One could even argue entire genres merely existing says something about the society that produces them. Instead of doing that, let's narrow our focus to two games, Civilization VI and Europa Universalis IV, and let's discuss their... politics. Today, I'm going to be making most of my arguments anecdotally, or from my own reading of the text, as it were. Trust me when I say I have an embarrassingly earned opinion on these games. I'm about to give a little introduction to the two games, so if you feel confident in your understanding of both titles and their premises, please feel free to skip ahead to this section. For the unaware and uninitiated, Sid Meier's Civilization is a series of games started in 1991 with several iterations and spin-offs. The series is old enough to have originally run in DOS. In the present, they're owned by 2K slash Take-Two Interactive and developed by Firaxis Studios. The series is the arguable grandfather of all computer strategy 4X games, which, given the original definition, is genuinely debatable at this point. Explore, expand, exploit, exterminate doesn't quite match up to the way Civ has been played for a very long time. But the inspiration that led to other games, the legacy, is undeniable. In Civ, you play as an abstraction of a nation, an eponymous civilization, throughout the span of history. Sometimes things blur a bit, in that there's a Greek Civ as distinct from a Byzantine Civ, and an Istanbul as distinct from Constantinople, and a Roman Civ, which has almost always been the sole Italian representative, but is sometimes present alongside Venice. That may be a bit confusing, but the point is that Civ deals with abstract representations of a nation that don't necessarily always have a continuity of civilization into the present day. There's also a roster of represented nations that, while having some core members that don't change, tends to have a rotating cast between games. You start out plopped into a vast, unsettled world of resources and geography in the year 4000 BC slash BCE, sometimes with some manner of a geographic start bias, which is intended to help your Civ do what it does best. Each Civ has their niche, something they do especially well, and some are geographically dependent, like the Inca with mountains or Canada with tundra. You play by moving around troops and workers and settling new areas with the general goal of expansion and development before setting up towards larger end goals. Science, culture, diplomacy, religion. There are several pursuits a player can direct themselves towards. Europa Universalis IV is a grand strategy game from developers Paradox Interactive. Grand strategy here is a way to define how zoomed out it is. It's sort of like risk when it comes to battles. You as the player do not witness, participate in, or take command during battles. Two forces meet and dice are rolled. The grand in grand strategy means that the strategy is not finely focused. The player can't directly influence roles in battle, leaving that part to an AI general. But it's also a reference to the fact the game is more about the grander strategy of managing a state. When something like Risk goes, oh, you own this or that tile, so you get X troops per turn, Europa Universalis has you concerned with things like provincial worth, cultures, buildings, manpower, modifiers on modifiers that change the efficiency and worth of individual provinces, and combat ability. The game starts with picking one of, uh, a lot of countries. While they're not all distinct and unique, Gameplay is mostly derived from a matrix of culture, religion, government, region, geography, missions, and development. So there may appear to be thousands of options, but the difference between many will be slight, and many states are non-distinct enough that you never see people talk about them. Once or twice, I've wanted to play a more obscure nation and looked it up on the subreddit for fun, only to find a single post and read it and be like, yeah, yeah, this guy gets it, and then I realized it was a post by me two plus years ago. The point of the game, divergent from Civ, is power. EU4 is ultimately more of a war game, about fueling one's ability to survive or expand, sometimes to a point that efficiency becomes more of an interest to certain players than raw expansion. You play by accounting for factors that make your chosen country's situation unique, 
and trying to rise to some self-defined greatness, take over the world, unite Italy a hundred years early, experience being Portugal in the age of exploration, or just like having fun in a sandbox, watching the world unfold. Both games do that. They are exercises in what-if history. What if, or alternate history, is essentially imagining the world on an alternate historical trajectory. Things like The Man in High Castle or Weird Books by Newt Gingrich. This extends to games like the Wolfenstein series. Sorry all the examples are what if the Nazis won, but it's just a very easy what if to come up with. The genre is adjacent to speculative fiction in that it imagines the way the world looks and is based on potential realities. My own personal definition places things like later entries into a plain fiction series as outside the genre. It doesn't really feel fair to call Resident Evil 4 alternative history just because it supposes a world where the events of Resident Evil 2 happen, you know? Go too far on what counts as alternative and you're just recreating fiction as a genre without, like, wizards. I don't know. It's easy to make up your own what if and then just run wild with the idea. What if the American Revolution never happened? What if Napoleon wasn't stopped? What if parents went to therapy? Europa and Civ allow players to ask these kinds of questions ludically with gameplay. Rather than being handed an alternative world, we play to create one. What if the Theravada kingdoms of the mid-1400s Sri Lanka could take all of mainland India and make it Buddhist? What if Sweden became the cultural epicenter of the world by virtue of immense museums and the tactical deployment of rock bands? That's what-if gameplay. On one level, and certainly from the outside, comparing these two games would seem a fairly obvious and non-controversial choice. But while I suspect there's a decent overlap of players for both games, who may also overlap with people who play other historical strategy like Total War, there are not many comparisons to be made in terms of gameplay. You play as a country in both games, and there's a focus on history as a setting, but that's kind of it. Saying Civ and EU belong in the same genre, or recommending one to someone because they like the other, would be like telling someone who enjoys Fortnite to check out Doom because they're both shooters. In fact, a better game for outright comparison with Europa is from the aforementioned Total War franchise, Empire Total War. It's not perfectly mapped on either, but it's closer given the framing and even mechanics. Technically there's another option, but it's uh, cursed and forgotten and somewhat fun, actually. My intent here isn't just to compare two popular games for the sake of it. I want to explore the way politics introduce themselves into these games, particularly in the light of their main appeal, What If History. I will primarily be sticking to two games, EU4 and Civ 6, though I will touch on other Civ entries where relevant. Earlier entries in the Civ series give us a roadmap of sorts and show the idea behind certain design choices and, in turn, when things are a non-choice, just following the traditions of the series. EU4 is one of the paradox games where you play as the state, or a nation, and as such, maps better onto Civ than the others. Crusader Kings may let you be Barbarossa or Saladin, but only for as long as they naturally live. Unlike Civ, they're not immortal avatars for their nations, and, as you may have noted from the screenshot, there is no entity of Arabia or Germany in them. This abstraction and the what-if focus make these two games ripe for comparison, but I chose them because I think EU4 is an especially useful lens for understanding certain issues in Civ. With that, I'll move on to my caveats. First things first, I am basing my critique of Europa upon my experience playing it up to the version 1.30. An incidental issue when analyzing these games is that they're still living products in development despite release years ago. I cannot fully say everything I note here will stand any test of time. In fact, to my understanding, some elements of Europa's colonial mechanics were just changed and I have no experience with them. Civilization could very well have some similar gaps, though I assume with both of these games, the things I'm talking about are not liable to be something so small as to be patched out, nor are they things I think the developers would see as issues in need of correction. Civ historically has some iffy elements, but this isn't a video about the history of Civ itself. I think 
For the most part, those things have been dealt with. All in all, the changes from 4 upward demonstrate, I think, a greater sensitivity to many things, or at least an awareness of the optics, if not genuine sensitivity. It's fairly likely that they get, by now, why it's weird to have a game with slavery as a function of government you opt into. Why barbarian cities are a bit of a statement, even if they're diverse in presentation, and how Native American Empire is a weird one to have as a sieve. I don't get the impression they caved to outside pressure or something so much as just grew. Started thinking more about intent. And that's why I'm even bothering to do all of this. Civ is more thought out now. Again, not as a quality argument, but as a worldview. As a piece of media meriting scrutiny and critique. Note also that neither of these games are being looked at in the lens of quality. Believe me, I have gripes with these games, studios, and publishers. But that's not the focus here. Said gripes might spill out on occasion, but this is not a review as products. It's a discussion, an analysis of the ideas present in these games, not their enjoyability or issues I have with them on a mechanical level. Okay, one gripe because it generally makes everything harder for absolutely no reason. Civ. Why did you get rid of access to the Civlopedia from the main menu? As a point of clarity, I don't think these games were made to make any sort of political statements. I don't think they set out to provide an agenda or propaganda, but much like any media, they reflect certain views in their worlds and what they prioritize or value. Said values are usually a bit more implicit than just outright statements, which I intend to demonstrate with Civ and Europa. It might not go the direction you think it does. Let's define a nation. Nations are a large body of people united by common descent, history, culture, or language inhabiting a particular country or territory. Whereas a state is a government. As such, the term nation-state exists for when a government is representative of a full nation. Civ has players playing as a nation, a unified but vague cultural entity. We simply are Germany. There is no Prussia versus Saxony versus Hanover, etc. EU4 deals with states rather than nations, and as such, something that might be a singular nation entity in Civ is, in EU4, a collection of states with an often feudal relation. Prussia and Saxony and Hanover can all exist at once despite all being German. Nationalism doesn't define a nation for most of EU4's timeline. Many nationalities are represented by a disunified mass of states, though coalescence is part of the game. China is the only real-world nation I can think of that fully gets the Civ treatment of being eternal in the casual format of pop history. People just say China when they could actually divide among dynasties as entirely distinct states. There's not actually a clean continuity between them, and it's often thanks to wars that new dynasties rise. But it's not as simple as owning the same landmass. We wouldn't, for example, call the Ilkhanate Persia simply because it held the territory. We wouldn't call Mexico the Aztec Empire because it's a different state. With China, people just kind of say China to mean whatever state has claimed authority in the region across most of history. It's why people give less shit to Milan for being in China than Aladdin for being in a made-up hodgepodge. Here's a counterexample to China that's just about as messy as Agrabah. Egypt, in Civ terms, is the land of pharaohs and pyramids, which have essentially existed since the dawn of Civ's timeline. Egypt disappears from the map for centuries in reality, and when a state does exist in that space, Civ wouldn't call it Egypt or associate it with Egyptian things. The Egypt that Civ means by Egypt stops existing sometime in the classical era, but Egypt as a state, as a country, is ostensibly represented by another historical ruler. Hell, I showed it before. Civ calls Saladin the leader of Arabia? Saladin, whom scholars believe is ethnically Kurdish, was the sultan of a realm that held less than half of the Arabian Peninsula and held its capital in Cairo, and he's somehow the leader of Arabia. I guess he led the 
Arab world, quote, against the Crusaders, but ultimately that seems like a narrow Western lens to adopt. Some foreshadowing for later. Maybe this is just a personal gripe spilling out again, but it feels like a good example of how messy Civ systems can get. Moving forward, there's something very important in the reality of EU4 where we play as the state, not a person or people. There's no measure for the quality of life within our society. There's no happiness mechanic, just faceless revolt. There's prosperity, but it's almost entirely accrued from not being attacked, and it has comparatively little to do with the stability and power of a state. There's development, and that is a measure of our success as a player, but it doesn't speak to quality of life or anything, just vague infrastructure or population. It's that obtuse. Neither prosperity nor development come directly from things like what goods your people have access to, well-patrolled roads, security, etc. They're byproducts of leadership and, in turn, are reduced to modifiers that bring in more hard currency for the state to wield. There is no way to say how people actually live within your nation. As such, the world doesn't actually present an ideal society. Arguably, the world is more prosperous when it is as fragmentary as possible. Each state produces a number of monarch points per month, and so, technically, the more states there are, the more points enter the world. The Holy Roman Empire exemplifies this in the game. Each state will have its own events and development. If each province in the game was its own state, the German region would be more developed by the end of the game than otherwise. Civilization, on the other hand, has varying depictions of unrest across time, but in Civ VI, it's largely reduced to the idea of outpacing one's population with amenities, a real bread and circuses approach to the people TM. Suffice to say, the player entity is a state once again, though unlike EU4, a timeless entity, a nation with a figurehead leader plucked from history to be an avatar of the nation, so to speak. As I said before, it gets dicey on who counts for what nation when, historically, most all nations have not existed for all of human history. Nations in Civ are not bounded by geography, neither in the sense of what much of their culture revolves around, nor in the sense of physical territory. In fact, as far as the physical world goes, Civ leaves a bit to be desired, and while I said I'd stay away from off-topic critique, this one has a surprise connection. Continents, as a construct, are a very consequential mechanic. Let's step back for a second. What is a continent? No, seriously, try and define why one exists. Why isn't Eurasia one continent? For the purpose of colonialism in both games, this question is critical. Continents have some weird and gamey rules in EU4, which, in part, try to simulate a few things. The issue becomes how the limitations they impose sour. Many have actually been resolved as the game got patched and expanded. Continents in Civ literally exist on a loose set of rules that seem to imitate the Asia and Europe distinction, but without an algorithm that shapes continents as well as the real-world geography. Now, this impacts gameplay, and excusing that this is reaching towards a full gripe, it means that a city the minimum four tiles away from your capital could be considered colonial for the purpose of every colonial civ bonus, while something on the same continent, which I can't even really define by landmass, but 50 hexes away, is somehow not a colony. The thing is, Civ has a lot of features that rely on this continent distinction, but there's hardly ever a downside. Civ more or less refuses to have negative trade-offs for things, and that means that the mechanics incentivize stuff like having a contiguous land empire but settling your capital on the opposite side of an arbitrary line. It's not really satisfying because geography won't let it be. Geography has a strong impact on colonialism in both games. In Europa, it's because of the asymmetrical positions of history. In Civ, it's in spite of symmetry. Europa Universalis has a few rigid points to it, and they're all based on geography. Where the Renaissance must spawn is one, and sure, okay. It helps the game's mirroring of historical power dynamics not immediately fly out the window for Northern Italy to be where the Renaissance begins. But another issue is the trade winds, and 
they might just be the most rigid part of the game. Trade wins are the term given to describe the direction money flows in the trade menu. Without going into the fairly complicated way that trade works, there are essentially endpoints that trade is always flowing towards and cannot flow out from. They exert global gravity or suction. Trade value from the new world cannot stay there. It always has to flow in some capacity towards Genoa, Venice, or the English Channel. For this reason, they might also do the most to reinforce Western supremacy, regardless of how the entire rest of alternate history shakes out. Europeans as colonizers, or really whoever controls these nodes, are always more efficient. One could conquer and raise Europe into dust as a horde empire and make Beijing the undisputed center of the universe and trade would still forcibly flow to the English Channel, Genoa, and Venice, and the winds don't change the way they blow. A vast majority of the quote-unquote empty colonizable provinces in the game are in the Western Hemisphere. By my count, there are about four provinces in Europe that are technically, according to the game, uncolonized in the sense of being stateless. Asia's quote-unquote empty spaces are more or less confined to the Pacific and Siberia, and Africa's to coastlines and rough interior like Saharan trade routes or space surrounding Lake Victoria's tribes that, in this instance, constitute a state as far as the game is concerned. The game doesn't make a huge issue that there are already people there, not even as a gameplay obstacle. If you click the right buttons, the natives will never impede you the way that a vanquished state would. Unsurprisingly, the easiest place to tear into EU4 from is its approach to colonialism. But, you know, I kind of get why they've done what they did with it. It's fun to just get new provinces from some semi-passive system of sending a dude to go organize a colony. It even gives you something to do that isn't just straight warfare. While I'm not going to play the impossible game of judging if having a fun central mechanic is worth reinforcing TM bad history, I will say that the, quote, empty provinces aren't usually empty. We're just not forced to go into war to get them. They're stateless and thus free to grab, which is still within the realm of the empty country myth. Europa Universalis is a game about the rise and eventual dominance of the West on the world stage. Indeed, arguably the story of the creation of said world stage, the advent of colonialism and global trade. On the surface, this would very easily give the impression of being a game with politics in it. From the outside, how could it not be? If you try to describe the gameplay, it basically comes off as imperialism is fun and cool. And yet, the game has a context built into it. EU4 has us winning or losing against real history and in a time frame that values the things the game values. You're taking on a role of leadership in a time period where states had specific interests and means to achieve their goals. There's no voter representation in turnout mechanics, civic engagement, poverty levels, concerns of the modern world and the modern state. The game doesn't have modern values draped across it. Or, well, not totally. We'll get to a part that challenges that. There's statecraft and expansion and empires and colonies and power and enlightenment but it literally takes place during a time period that was all about that. It all centered on a time when Europe was the center of the world. It's zoomed in enough to have a focus, where Civ is so zoomed out as to be totalizing. The resources are, ostensibly, money and governmental power, but it's still not so zoomed in that we get things like demographics and population needs. There are resources in the form of goods produced by provinces, but the player has no economic control nor need to obtain specific ones, as in Civ. There's no food management or luxury resource needs simulated in the game. Your people will not crave resources that you need to get into some tangible stockpile. Provinces produce goods that are just a means to money and modifiers. Civ is broad. It's totalizing enough to submit itself to different scrutiny. Food, production, culture, science, 
of course, these are general and consistent enough needs in human history as resources to stay an unchanging currency for the whole game. It's about a rendition of all human history, but that comes with its own priorities not introduced or forced by the lens. One is then set to question not what did this era value, but what is the world valuing? And that's a weird question, right? There's no way to get an answer. And that forces us to refocus. It's not a telling of anything, because all of human history, quote, is not a simple story. It reminds us the question for Europa slash paradox should be corrected to what did the developers see as valued in this era, and as such, for Civ, the question becomes what do the developers see as valued in the world? Civilization has no scope or lens inherent in its conceit, and as such, is sort of offered to us just as a story of the world. One could excuse this as, well, it would be too hard to model everything, all of history, all cultures, with as much detail as EU4, and so generalizations become necessary. But that just opens up the important question, what is this generally applied model derived from? And that question beckons politics be revealed. EU4 has a lens, and thus less implicit and ultimately less propagandistic content, whereas Civ does indeed posit victory in culture and progress across and for all of history, providing us no lens. There's no one correct way to read either of these games, but I would say once you look beyond the question of is EU4 glorifying this era, which can be debated, we're left with a fairly narrow reading of things that come off as a stretch. I wouldn't say that an absence of population and demographics makes it better or worse, nor would I say that it means the developers don't care about social history. The game just isn't centered on it, unlike Humankind or something, which is a very people-centered game, at least in its language. However, both games risk neutralizing the events they portray as, quote, just inevitable, or historically neutral rather than historically factual. There's a difference between that's just the way things were and declawing the beast that is colonialism. But the issue is less one that's on the heads of developers and more what players bring to their understanding of the game. I'm certain that for every haha this makes fascism look cool I love it player in a game about history, there's more people who understand that it's just a game. Which is good, but it, again, risks positing historical events cannot be judged or are value neutral. It's a fine line. I would say that, all in all, there's absolutely a difficult optics to these games. They are definitely just games, but they're certainly also games about something. The issues with playing them sort of parallel the issues some people have with discerning content from approval. A book with problematic characters does not endorse problematic actions simply by virtue of representing them. And with that, we have to turn to the big caveat. These games let you do things we would today call very bad, to put it lightly. The time period, naturally, runs into the reality of things like colonialism, slavery, and uh, state-orchestrated violence against targeted specific groups of people on the basis of things like culture. EU4, again, as a game with more depth, digs a bit deeper than Civ, even when it comes to atrocity, but it still manages to keep things fairly distanced. Slaves are a trade good. Enslavement isn't a choice the player makes, it's assigned to provinces either from the start or when building a colony in them. The player does not get to choose to be a slaver. There are events in the game announcing the establishment of the triangle trade, but there's no direct interaction to set it off. Slaves are not a profitable good, however, when compared to the majority on the list of goods. I don't think this is intended to curb players from trading in slaves per se, making the unethical content unappealing with respect to gameplay so much as, mm, and this is a bit of tricky wording, but I'm being very intentional. Slaves are not super profitable comparable to slave labor, which is fully obfuscated in game. As I mentioned before, the game doesn't have you manage resources. 
you do not import things. And when you combine that with the lack of demographic representations in the game, slaves themselves barely make a footprint on gameplay. The plantation-style crops in the game don't get a global production boost with the advent of the triangle trade or European presence in coastal sub-Saharan Africa. There's no modifier on individual provinces that says, this one's using slave labor plus 20% production. Ultimately, that's all up for debate, and is what I meant before when I said EU4 might have a segment of modern values imparted into it. We, as players in control of a state, cannot actively engage with slavery aside from banning it near the game's conclusion. This leads us to a few things the player can do that would be more active participation in things that could be defined as atrocity. I'll avoid talking about what the game incentivizes in gameplay here because it can be subjective. In one sense, for Civ, if you're a perfectionist player, you could argue that city placement is critical and, as such, be incentivized to commit uh, war crimes and wipe out entire cities just to make sure your cities are in the right place, spaced apart, or just to get the right resources. As far as active participation goes, there's three actions by my count in EU4 that could constitute atrocity, which the player has to click to make happen. Your empire will not passively do these things, and they are attack native populations as distinct from the state, like not declaring war on the Sioux nation slash state, but just parking a battalion in a stateless bit of land and attacking the people there. Pirating a coastline and pressing slaves into maritime service. Expel minorities to the New World, which I will note here is a weird one to have added to a DLC about modeling Spain, since Spain forbade minorities from going to the New World whenever possible. And convert province culture, which is kind of stuck in an eternal debate in the community about what that entails, and that it isn't a violent action, and that it's more like replacing governors, not people, and... I genuinely don't have a clear idea how I even feel about it or perceive it, to be honest. Cultures and cultural items should often be judged by the mores of the periods they were in, immediately preceded by and immediately followed by. There needs to be a basis for judgment that is acknowledged. That's not to say one should forgive racists of the past, so much as context should be understood or else you lose sight of what makes something or someone especially heinous especially worthy of record. Condemning a century doesn't do a lot of good. In fact, condemning Columbus as a racist is underselling how fucking lootly awful he was. It's far more important to condemn the structures of colonialism that make their way into our lives than the participants, especially at the lower level. The debate about just following orders does not apply universally. We need to know details like moral framework in order to understand how atrocities happen. Also, there aren't exactly bad person points in either of these games. Nations do not get annoyed for actions because of morals or ethos other than either being mad you beat them to it or team politics like I'm team democracy and you're team communism. There aren't really tensions like, hey, you used slave labor and it's past the enlightenment. There's no Bartolome de las Casas popping up whenever you click the attack native button to petition the Pope or Papal State to condemn you. But the counter argument there is often the mechanics are available to most everyone, which leads us to our next section. Now that we've covered what the games allow, let's talk about how players actually play them. The culture of what if in EU4 largely comes out in two to three ways subverting expectations for a nation, surpassing historical realities, and turnabout. Subverting expectations is like general insurmountable odds. Surpassing realities is like fast Italy, Spain gets all of the new world, or realizing some ambition of the real world nation, like taking Constantinople as Russia or something. Turnabout isn't a term used in these communities, and it sort of straddles the space between the other two, which is why I was hesitant in giving a number of categories. But I think it's also the strongest impetus beyond full-on unreal things like reforming the Roman Empire, as far as EU4 is concerned. Objection! Objection!
Turnabout is, in general, the idea of flipping one's circumstances. There are a lot of posts in both communities concerned with this paradigm. In Civ, it's usually just boiled down to like, haha, I took over Germany as Poland. It can't be much more than that because every nation starts out symmetrical. But in Europa, it's an underdog story with a historical antagonist notion. It's a mix of subverting expectations and surpassing history. When you mix the two, you get subverting reality. Achievements give us a window into this with EU4. Here are some that emphasize this. Some of these are about raw challenge, but sometimes the community just memes about, like, again, Poland taking over Germany. Achievements, at least so far as EU4 is concerned, are more interesting, notable, and praiseworthy than score. I have never seen a post online on either Reddit or the dedicated forums where someone says, look at my score. Few people probably play with it in mind. I've never seen a post where someone detailed their guide on getting a high score to optimizing the way score points are earned. So then we get to another point. How do you win EU4? I won't be talking about what power gaming the games incentivize because cheese is not quite intended play. Like, I'm not going to make the argument that the devs of EU4 see Orthodox Ottomans as the TM ideal state or something, nor would I suggest that strictly optimal play is a declaration of intent. EU4 is largely about player set goals, or those aforementioned achievements. Runs are almost entirely defined by self-made rules, goals, and constraints. The only universal goals that need little to no explanation are world conquest and its variants. Achievements give people a common language to explain the challenge and intent of a given run. You can just say, Norwegian would attempt, instead of, Hey guys, I thought it might be cool to try and take every province that produces naval supplies. Missions are a strange exception to this player-driven model because they give us the most what-if guidance in the game. Missions transcend player agency into providing hypotheticals. Where a player can take the game as a tool to posit what if Breton colonization, the missions say, what if Morocco became invested in the global piracy and decided it needed a forward operating base in Iceland? I do think missions are worth a mention, but as for gleaning worldview, it's basically all just for fun what if stuff, not in an ideal world. I don't think EU4 makes much of a claim towards any ideal worlds. It's a vehicle, as is Civ, with some parameters, and a means some players use to create a world or history. EU4, of course, has issues modeling many things, ranging from colonial resistance and the importance of administration in massive empires to historical rates of expansion. Just try and match the real world Ottoman or Spain year for year. There's no way. Conversely, Playing EU4 might leave one just saying, why didn't Spain simply cross the strait and colonize Morocco? How did they leave heathen neighbors just sitting there for so long that they remained independent for centuries? Because in-game, it's that simple. A game as England where the player took until 1715 to get Scotland and form Britain would be comically bad. It's hard to look at any of these elements and interpret them as having much of a worldview. Civ is different. Symmetrical starts ironically water down the what-if creative freedom, especially when coupled with what I'll call cultural consistency. The fact that England will always exist presupposed to be a maritime nation, even if they never get access to the ocean. Symmetrical starts have other baggage we'll get to later. The what-if largely comes out in the way victory is achieved in Civ, with achievements more often being like the pun ones in EU4. Because of the symmetry, the what-if isn't one for sharing, what if I pulled off this crazy but communicable thing, it's one for playing. The whole game is a what-if. It's history redone. Your alternate history has no point of diversion from the real world, only coalescences into real history. This'll also come back. Of course, what-if will inevitably be limited by who-if. There's always the curious question of who gets in to a Civ title. 
there are core sieves that have never been excluded, and then there's newcomers and rotating members. The core sieves, like the permanent members of the UN Security Council, with whom they share conspicuous overlap, have always been in. The permanent casts are the sieves on this chart, with a fun note that you can trim the chart a bit if you account for all of those notes which more or less specify that the sieve was a later addition to a game in the form of DLC or an expansion or bonus content. The main roster is basically a mix of relevant to the world wars and the ancient world according to ninth grade history. The permanent roster expands over time, usually with what I can describe as slots for representation. Denmark, Norway, and the Vikings tend to have some degree of overlap or interchange, but Sweden has been distinct for a few games now. Native North American representatives have rotated ever since being decoupled from, uh, the Native American Empire as their absurd representation in one game. Treating all North Americans as one nation is a laughable choice, regardless of their status as an empire. Civilization starts on a shaky ground. Turn one is settling. Cities are all and everything. This, right at the start, is where Civ's symmetry becomes something of a statement. Conversely, raiding hordes and nomadic migratory cultures in EU4 at least have a different structure, and that impacts gameplay. From turn one to turn done, Civ is about reaching towards very specific goals that prize Western values. That's where all the turnabout and what-ifs are forced to lead in Civ 6. What if the Maya invented space travel, not stopping to beg the question of if they even ever would, irrespective of ability. I would even argue that baking in an inevitability so deep as victory hurts one's ability to become invested in the stories of their game. No longer is this the story of Molly, of how things went for them, it's now the story of Molly's manifest destiny type drive towards colonizing Mars. The concern about nomadic peoples is something that could be itself explored more, as no entry in the Civ series is ever free from this fundamental issue. It is, in fact, impossible to exit that pit without changing the premise of the game's symmetrical start, and indeed, gameplay and continuity. Other games in the broad genre of 4X have conditions where different factions may use entirely different resources with no overlap. They play differently, and perhaps nomadic peoples could have been like that. Like in Crusader Kings 2, maybe. They still paint the map, that is, focus on expansion above all else, in that game. And like EU4, they're limited by what the game can model, but doing a horse lord nomadic campaign is fundamentally different from a feudal one, or a republic, where in Civ it would just end up being like, your units move further in a turn, you get a bonus to pastures, or something. Almost nobody has fundamentally unique gameplay in Civ 6, aside from like, Molly or the Maori, and that's because they change the game up. So there's problems with the starting point and the end point of history in Civ. Good. Okay. Done. But let's talk about a turning point right in the middle of the timeline parallel to EU4. Where EU4 again chooses its lens, Civ, in being a generalist view of history, the universal story, creates a political statement. It may just count things within the canon of the world, but realistically things shift around the same era that EU4 encompasses, which makes them ripe for comparison in this. It's less of a sandbox of historical possibility and more become the West as anyone. Feudalism is not a focus of EU4, but it is technically something some nations on the map need to discover, and conveniently, it's where the start of Civ's departure from generalism into Eurocentrism begins. Speaking towards history, it can be argued with relative ease that the discoveries of the ancient and classical eras in Civ games are applicable to most societies. Part of this is enabled by the general way they are described. Sailing does not specify an exact type of boat. Philosophy is just philosophy, as broad as that. The advancement isn't Platonism, Greek thought, it is something with analogs across the world. One can imagine that philosophy works for whatever society they're playing as. The whole world has thinkers. There are also some outliers, things that large civilizations did not ever figure out in a traditional sense, ranging from irrigation to astronomy to ironworking. Astrology is in the game, and a strange research at that, but it is vague and broad enough to apply to many peoples, I suppose. But these things tend to be the ones the West 
figured out. Admittedly, it's difficult to imagine a tech that was simply absent from the Western world for centuries. Part of that has to do with how the West slash Europe is a misnomer in terms of cohesion and consistency, and some of this taps into Civ's biggest failing, for me personally, which is the abject inability to model loss and downfalls. I mean, concrete was developed by the Romans and became a lost technology for centuries, thus being discovered again in the Renaissance, which is also perhaps bizarre to even have a Renaissance era, a rebirth, when nothing ever really fades away in Civ. Feudalism does not map as well onto the rest of the world. China more or less lacks it historically. Confucian power relationships and the Sinocentric worldview all but replace it and are hardly analogous. If you read historical accounts trying to sum up China and Japan and their governments and the relations between them, it's full of anachronisms and outright error. As a fun aside, Japanese scholars coming out of isolation and trying to understand the West were biased and confused as well. Aizawa Seishisai's new theses include segments describing the relationship between Russia and Britain as one of subservience, and thought New England was still a British colony, even though it was 1807. But back to China and mapping technology onto them. Here's an excerpt from John Fairbank's work, Chinese World Order. China was sculpting a world order. The relation between China and the tributary states is non-analogous to the Western models of vassalization, in that China presupposes its superiority, and is inherently the central locus of power. China's crafted world order is not one of possessing vassals, and thus more power through domination, but using the tribute system to reinforce an image of power. If all the interstate expressions of diplomacy are made with China in mind, then peace and order are established merely through China's position, the universal preeminence of the Son of Heaven. Terms like king and duke historically got used where they cannot be applicable. Sinocentrism and the tribute system, represented as part of the Mandate of Heaven mechanic in EU4, baffled Westerners. I would go so far as to argue that EU4 actually manages to depict the system fairly well, and in this, they succeed at the delicate balance between working in a lens and working with reality. They don't just give us a historically wrong Western understanding of the tribute system. It doesn't come off as the other Holy Roman Empire mechanic. It mirrors reality and transcends the lens, in this case, for the better. Ultimately, this issue is not that Civ lacks nuance or specificity, but what it spends that energy, that nuance, on. What is the Enlightenment? Why does it matter? According to Civ, the Enlightenment is a sprawling intellectual, philosophical, cultural, social movement marked by empiricism, scientific rationalism, and reductionism displayed in the questioning of religious and political orthodoxy. It unlocks liberalism, rationalism, and free markets. Civ basically falls into the same question every game. What if the Enlightenment happened? One could say this is one of many texts in the game like this, but Something like humanism is at least vague in the right way to be mappable onto other cultural movements across the world, which Civ itself seems to agree with. The Enlightenment's global presence in our real world is a product of colonialism, homogenization, and hegemony. From feudalism on, the trend is established that the technology and culture to be acquired is that which resembles the real world West. China a nation-slash-state-slash-civilization that has been in Civ since the beginning is no longer allowed to contribute to the inevitable timeline of technology and advancement. The divine right of kings, which the Mandate of Heaven is sometimes compared to, would be a classical era tech if China was centered more in Civ. Hell, for some sense of scale, if political philosophy is a 6th century BCE thing, analogous with Confucius and the Greek philosophers, the Mandate exists hundreds of years prior to that. There is no entry for the tribute system, or tributary relations, or some such thing. China is forced to learn the West's structure, but the game does not, in turn, force the West to do an equitable detour from real history. The culminant issue is that what-if history isn't actually allowed much freedom from the late medieval era on. The Enlightenment is 
presupposed, it is the path forward. Colonialism is inevitable. Let's recontextualize this a little. Imagine if Civ had another requirement beyond the simple one that the Enlightenment must happen for everyone. Imagine if the game treated state atheism as a historical inevitability in the same way, slapped right in the middle of a tech tree. We would, quite correctly, question that. And you might say, well, but that didn't happen. Secularization occurred in much of the world, but state atheism was largely confined to revolutionary and or communist countries. And yeah, it wasn't global, but nor was the Enlightenment a global revelation. The point is that, overall, what becomes a tech or a civic is being decided by people with certain biases or presumptions about how history works, and those biases deserve scrutiny. Earlier I said, rather than being handed an alternative world, we play to create one. And I want to emphasize what that means for our purposes one last time. What if gameplay, like this, doesn't just hand us a narrative, a constructed alternate world, it hands us a toolbox. But if your toolbox only includes a drill, you sure as hell aren't going to build a boat. In the end, the concern is not that Civ does a bad job modeling things. It is, after all, just a game. It's that there's a bias which pretends it isn't there. It cannot avoid pretending that because it has to be a neutral presentation of history. Likewise, Europa Universalis hands us a more constrained framework but doesn't attempt to be nearly as neutral or educational. There's an academic discipline adjacent to the study of history called historiography, the study of historical writing. It is, to be brief, a discipline that looks at and recognizes errors in our assessments, recollections, and biases as writers and interpreters of history. What is Civ if not a chronicle of history? It is still just a game, but it's a game that took thousands of collective hours to create, filled with the truth and knowledge about the world, expertise and understanding about the past. People learn things from it. That's always been a selling point and an intent. To say it's just a game and beneath the use of a historiographical lens is wrong. I've purposefully stuck to one era in Civ's telling of history, purposefully avoided the quotes because I cannot fully know when they're intended as pearls of knowledge, satire, just a perspective, or the developer's perspective. There's so much more I could dig through to show potential biases, but I thought this era, as a point of comparison more driven by foundational issues, would be an interesting way to argue that Civ has modern neoliberal bias. I went through and looked at a lot of quotes from 4 through 6 in making this, and I really could have made a two-minute video just collating all the unironic Churchill quoting, and that'd be the end of it. I may still do that. Ultimately, I would say two things. As media, the way it hands us an experience, the feigned neutrality, can be dangerous to us as students of history, of all varieties, casual and academic, beginner and expert. And as a game, we players don't get to imagine a what-if world. We get to experience a palette swap of our present one, and that's just kind of lame given what it could have been. Hey, thanks for watching to the end. I haven't really been doing things like saying hi in the beginning because it feels weird to talk to an audience that I don't know and doesn't exist yet, but um, yeah. So the next video is probably going to be about like Dark Souls 2 and theory crafting, but it's going to be a lot shorter and much lighter of a topic than this one or the last one. Um, I hope you stick around to catch it or subscribe so that it shows up when it's out. I'm going to stay away from doing more Civ or Europa content for a little while because I'm predictably burnt out after a 50 minute video. Um, I can always, however, be coaxed into doing like a unhinged rant about what I feel about Civ 6, so if there is an interest in that, coax me into doing so. Bye.